to the program shortly. I request everyone coming to the auditorium. Good evening, all. The Indian Constitution I request everyone to rise in silence to remember late Fali as Nariman, the renowned Indian Jew. Thank you all. Twenty twenty four, and the Vice President of Kerala High And other students of the faces challenges in the current scenario. We have with us Honorable Mr. Justice Udili. Matthew Joseph was born in Kochi, Kerala on June 17, 1958. He completed his secondary education from Kendriya Vidyalaya, Kochi and New Delhi. He later joined Leola, Chennai and obtained his law degree from Government Law College, Ernangula. He began practicing in the Delhi High Court after enrolling as an advocate in 1982. Onwards, July 2014. Our of nearly five years. We are profoundly pleased and highly honored to hear your authentic 
authentic deliberation on the topic of secularism and association to deliver much awaited and most significant lecture on I take this opportunity on behalf of Kerala High Court Advocates Association who gathered here for hearing the lecture on the topic of Thank you. Today we have with us the former judge of the Supreme Court of India, Justice Dean. Good evening to all of you. Brother Judges, this is Nambia, this is Kaushar the office bearers and my dear friends. It's a homecoming, always very heartening to be back here. The same auditorium brings, evokes a lot of memories. Um, and uh, since tomorrow is a working day, I'll straight away get down to business. As you know, India became a republic on the 26th of January, 1950. It was preceded by deliberations by a constituent assembly lasting two years, 18 months, 11 months, and 18 days. The topic for today is secularism, the concept of secularism in the Indian constitution. As you know, after a long struggle which began after 1858, when the reins of government passed to the British Crown under the 1858 Act. Unfortunately, it culminated when freedom was won, it came with a price, namely the partition of India. Pakistan chose the theocratic model of government. It also had a constituent assembly. As an aside, I can tell you, while our uh, Constituent Assembly finished their business and uh, it was adopted on the 26th of November 1949, came into force on the 26th of January 1950, the very first Constitution of Pakistan, which came into force, came into force only in the year 1956. It took almost nine years for the Constituent Assembly of Pakistan to finish their business. But even that 1956 constitution was short-lived as uh, there were interventions on the part of the military in particular. There was a tussle over the center of power, whether it's a president, prime minister, the role of the military. That led to the second constitution which came to be framed in the year 1962. And that is not the end of the story, because the present con the constitution which rules Pakistan is of the year 1973. So they have had three constitutions. Our constitution, fortunately, has stood the test of time for, the, for more than nearly 75 years. Now, as far as secularism goes, the word secular is not to be found in the preamble as it stood on 26 January 1950. Interestingly, if you go through the constant assembly debates, which I would ask all the young lawyers here to purchase that uh, just five volumes, I mean five books consisting of about 13 volumes, it will give you very interesting insight. And since this is part of uh, continuing legal education, it becomes my duty to remind the youngsters that the idea of education is one of evolution through your life itself. Try till your last moment as a lawyer. Please do not think that you know anything, that you are still a lawyer. This is the beauty of the legal profession, that you can continue to discover new and new things. So. Because, as you know, the, our Bible starts with the words, we, the people of India, have resolved our, to constitute ourselves into a dem dem sovereign democratic republic. One of the members, H.V. Kamath, wanted to add the words, in the name of God, before 
the words we the people. A member from Kerala, interestingly, A. Tanupilla, objected, saying, see, what happens is, if you see the debates, the debates on the preamble took place towards the end of the Constant Discipline debates, after all the other articles had been debated and articulated. So we already had Article 25, which gives, as you know, the fundamental right to practice, profess, and propagate religion. So he got up and said, what is the point in having in the words in the name of God? Because there are people who may believe in God, there are people who may not believe in God. So how on earth do we have as members who are, as you know, the members of the Constituent Assembly were not directly elected by the people. They were elected by members of the provincial assemblies. And they were members of the provincial assemblies themselves. So, said, how do we represent people who have been given the freedom of conscience under Article 25, which means the right to believe in, you can be an agnostic, you can be an atheist, you can be in decent, you can be in any of the many brands. So, another very more interesting and hilarious, I, mean, I wouldn't say hilarious, very difficult to say that. One of the members said, why are you limited to gods? I belong to a cult who, which worships goddesses. So if you want to add in the name of God, you must also add in the name of God and goddesses. The, though the president um, persuade, tried to persuade Kamath to not move the amendment, he insisted. It was put to division and it was defeated. One of the planks of reasoning adopted by Dr. Ambedkar, who was the chairman of the drafting committee, was look at the Constitution, the United States Constitution, also doesn't have in the name of God. So finally, that attempt at um, including in the name of God, God shelved. There were the first attempt was um, defeated. There was not much discussion on it, but it was defeated. Kate an amendment to introduce Article 18A before Article uh, 25 of the present constitution, which has you no know, gifts, everyone, every person the right to office. of any class of its citizens or other persons in the union. But even this amendment did not go through. I think it was not moved or it was defeated. The result is that word secular speaks by its absence. So many words, it is not there. But there was agreement, if you go through uh, the drift of the Constant Assembly debates, is particularly in the aftermath of the traumatic incidents leading to the partition, they were very clear that India would not take the theocratic route, that India would be a secular country. Now, what is secularism? Well, because there are different brands of secularism. And before that, I will just refer you to a few judgments where uh, even before the 42nd Amendment slipped in the words uh, socialism and secularism on, with effect from 3-1-1977, there are two or three judgments I will just briefly refer to because they would show that even without the addition of the word secularism in the preamble, it, secularism was considered as part of the basic feature. In Keshav Ananda Bharati, that is 1973, 4 SCC, page 225, 13 judges, as you know, uh, propounded the basic structure theory that what you cannot amend the constitution so as to amend it out of shape that the basic features are effaced. Now, two out of the uh, many, many judges, in fact, have uh, specifically culled out features even at that stage, and they have said secularism is one of the basic features. Now, another decision which 
uh, speaks about secularism is a judgment in 1976 to SEC page 17, that is Siyauddin uh, Bukhari versus uh, Bridge Mohan. It's a case which arose under section 123.3 of the Representation of People's Act, which is one of, one of the most important haunting themes which you will find in the context of secularism, and which I'll be referring to. Now here, the, both the parties were Muslims. The complaint against the respondent in the election petition was that the elected candidate made an allegation against the defeated candidate that he is not actually a practicing Muslim, that he is a heretic, and tried to run him down. The court said, this is big, Chief Justice is big, he was not, uh, Chief Justice is that, he said, for the first, you know, I would um, suggest to you that you read that judgment, this is three short paragraphs, and I will not detain you further, substance of it that by the time the basic structure theory had been propounded, because this judgment was pronounced on 24-4, um, 24-4-2003, I mean, after this uh, Keshava and the Bhairavi. So he said that this will defeat an appeal based on religion is not just merely a personal rant against the respondent, but it is also uh, uh, an appeal which will culminate in the defeat of the basic structure. You find a, a, a reference to it. Next, you will bear in mind the celebrated judgment of the Supreme Court in the St. Saviour's case. It related to the interplay of Articles 29 and 30 um, and the scope of Article 30. There, uh, you'll see that um, uh, Justice Matthew, speaking also for Justice Chandrachud, at paragraph 139 and 140, this is uh, the, the judgment, I'll just read it's only one sentence. We have grave doubts whether the expression secular state as it denotes a definite pattern of church and state relationship can with propriety be applied to India. It is only in a qualified sense that India can be said to be a secular state. In para 140, quote, in short, secularism in the context of our constitution means only an attitude of live and let live, developing into the attitude of live and help live. In, at paragraph 75, you will find a more detailed discussion by Justice Kanna. Uh, I wouldn't want to, you know, detain because I have to go far. But therein, what Justice Kanna would say is essentially that the secularism means only this, that it treats the believer, the agnost, the atheist alike. It treats each religion with equality. Various rights, which I shall be referring to in the Constitution, does speak about the, 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 the secular nature of our Constitution, and that's it. Now, since Justice Matthew, speaking on his behalf and behalf of uh, Justice Chandrachut, as his Lordship then was, um, spoke about a wall separating, not a wall, it is not exactly a wall. What really is this wall and what is this separation? In order to understand this, and since a lot of criticism also has been directed against the concept of secularism in India, and which uh, has led to you know, demands that the word secularism should be deleted, is the, is the idea that secularism is actually a Western model. It is an offshoot of the developments which took place in Europe and the United States. Now, what is that? See, from ancient times, the church had a great authority over the king. Christianity reads the shows of uh, the third uh, the uh, kingdom, England, somewhere in the third century. As you know, Christianity reached um, India sometime in the first century is, is a claim. So it came only in the third century. By around the eighth century, the Roman Catholic Church assumed control. Um, because there are five C's, you know, S-E-E, -E, which means seats of Christian faith, you know, Constantinople, Antioch, you know, from where the Syrians belong to, and, and Rome. They were called the bishops of Rome. 
by a very uh, lengthy convoluted process we are not concerned with, the Bishop of Rome actually gained primacy, became what is the Pope today for the Catholics and became the Roman Catholic Church. So by the 8th century, in England also, the Angle, Angles and Saxons, the French and the English, the fights between them, I need not go into all that. The Roman Catholic Church became the entrance church. In 1215 AD, as you know, the Magna Carta, the Charter of Rights, the Great Charter of Rights, one of the few documents of the Constitution of the United Kingdom emerged. You know, it means basically the barons and the priests, they wanted to get rights from the king, which were being denied to them. And he gave a charter. Though King John gave the charter in 1215, he had other intentions. He rushed to Rome, I mean, he wrote to Rome, and the Pope annulled the uh, Magna Carta, which means he interfered with the affairs of the state. Such was the influence of the Pope. It was later reissued on a number of occasions, and finally, first was by the regent, and then the, his son uh, issued in 1225. So the Magna Carta, as we came, to, as we know it today, came to be finally issued. But this is after an interference. Around the 14th century, you know, another development took place, which lasted for about four centuries, and that is the Renaissance, as you know it. The Renaissance is a period of time when people started thinking on their own, started doubting. Galileo said that the Roman Catholic Church teaching that the sun goes around the earth is wrong. It was, of course, imprisoned. People started going back perhaps to the Greeks, Plato, Aristotle, started in, uh, indulging in dialectics, thinking, debating, and science flourished, the arts flourished. Alongside, in the Roman Catholic Church, there are a lot of problems, a lot of corruption, because salvation was put up for sale. You could buy a place in heaven if you paid some money to the priests. So when that took place, finally Martin Luther, as you know, the Lutheran, the, the, the Protestant, the beginnings of the Protestant church in Wittenberg in Germany, when they nailed 95 theses in the church, and Protestantism spread, and it spread also to England. Once this happened, Yet another development which is relevant and interesting to notice was King Henry VIII, the personality of King Henry VIII. He was married. No, he fell in love with a lady called Anne Boylan. He wanted to marry her. The Pope, the Catholic Pope said nothing doing. This is against the rules of the Catholic Church. You have not made out a ground for grant of uh, divorce. So the king said, okay, then go to hell. If you do not give me divorce, I will change. And he actually established the Anglican Church. Now, the Anglican Church is actually a species of the genus which is the Protestant Church. The Protestant Church, and as I said, Martin Luther went around. drink alcohol, I mean, nothing to do with it. All Bloody Mary because of the violence that her nationalism between Catholics and Protestantism grew by the way. Um, then came Elizabeth, supposed to be a fairly stable rule of about 35 years. She was a Protestant. In 1628, you had the Petition of Right, another important constitutional document in the UK Constitution. And then finally, towards the end of the 17th century, you had Parliament being fully established. 
Now, alongside this, there is another development which is of importance and relevance for our topic, which is that when the Protestant, uh, Protestant church was established in England, there are a lot of people who are not satisfied with the form of religion that Protestantism actually presented. Now, they were called the Puritans, Quakers. Now, Quakers mean that actually you will tremble at the word of God. I mean, when you read the Bible, you, know, you have to be very careful that you know, it's going to come now. And they, they were called Quakers. There were people of you know, religious dissidents group against the Protestant church, which is what the uh, religion born out of revolt. Now, they in turn came to be persecuted by the Protestant church in England. So, they actually wanted to move away to some other place. Now, America, the United States, Newfoundland, continent. Referring to them, one was freedom from an established church. So it is called the establishment clause. I think I have given you some materials. Establishment clause of the First Amendment is called. The second is the free exercise clause. Now the free exercise is the right to practice, profess practicing, uh, propagating the religion. And the third is the free speech, which is Corresponding to Article 91 of our Constitution. The, the free exercise clause corresponds to Article 25 and 26 of the Constitution. There, there is no corresponding clause to the establishment clause except you know, the secularism clause, uh, thing which you have, and you will see the difference as I go after. So this clause came to be interpreted in a continuum of decisions. I have referred to a few of them, they to the extent that they are uh, necessary. In 1947, Everson versus Board of Education. Now, I would, at this stage, pause for a moment and like to tell the youngsters that kindly make it a point to travel overseas over internet. Take your mobile phone, just take your voice search, just speak into the uh, phone the citation from the United States Constitution. If you get the Wikipedia part of it, you will get a small column which says oral argument, which means if you turn it on, anywhere in the world, you can listen to the actual arguments which were addressed by the council. After that, you will get the judgment. Again, you just press it, you will get the entire judgment. You will get the script and you will also get the voice um, transcript alongside. So I would respectfully advise all of you to uh, make use of this unique facility with which you are all blessed. Many of our predecessors were not, you have to go through dusty libraries and you know, try to find out. It's not, so it's become so easy now. So this ever uh, this Everson versus Board of Education is about 330 United States page 1, in the year 1947, the question which was raised there was as to whether it is violative of the establishment clause that you shall not establish a church. If the state, if it was in that case, in that case was a board, would bear the cost of transporting students to parochial schools, so called because they were Catholic schools, not the public schools, whether it is 
legal, constitutional to bear the cost. Very important to that I just read out a, a small portion uh, which stood the law even till recently. The establishment of religion clause of the First Amendment means at least this. Neither the state nor the federal government can set up a church. Neither can pass laws which aid one religion, aid all religions, or prefer any religion over another. Neither can force nor influence a person to go to or remain away from church against his will or force him to profess a belief or displease any religion. No person can be punished for entertaining or professing religious beliefs or disbeliefs for church attendance or non-attendance. No tax in any amount, large or small, can be levied to support any religious activities or institutions, whatever they may be called, or whatever form they may adopt to teach or practice religion. Neither a state nor the federal government can openly or secretly participate in the affairs of any religious organizations or groups and vice versa. In the words of Jefferson, the clause against the establishment of a religion by law was intended to erect a wall of separation between the church and the state. This is a wall of separation which is referred to by Justice Matthew in the decision in St. Saviour's. Now the next decision which I would like to play before you is a decision in Abington School Authority versus Kemp. I have given, I think, the citation, if I have not, it is 374 United States, 203, 1963. In that case, the state actually, in a state school, Bible readings were arranged, which means the students were to would come and read the Bible without coming, without anyone giving a commentary. The court said you have no business doing that without violating the establishment clause. The state cannot have anything to do with religion. It's a state school. Keep away from religion. But it's very important to note that in that case, the court also said an academic study of comparative study of religions may not be barred under the establishment clause. You will find that how our Indian court in one of the decisions which I shall refer to has also followed the same pattern and it's okay. Uh, this uh, 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 view. The next statement is in Marsh versus Chambers. It's very significant from our point of view. It is 463 United States 783. It was decided in the year 1983. The question there was the Nebraska legislature actually started its legislative proceedings, which was always preceded by a prayer by a Christian chamberlain a priest paid for by the legislature. The question was whether it's, whether is it not offensive, offensive to the uh, establishment clause of the First Amendment. The court did not uh, uh, actually uh, uh, agree to uh, apply. I'm extremely sorry, I just got a little bit of a... There is a, a, a case before this, which I must bring you on notice, which is Lemon versus Kurtzman, 403 United States, 602, 1971. This is perhaps the most important judgment in relation to the First Amendment uh, Establishment Clause. This is a case where actually the court evolved what is called a three-prong test to decide whether any state law action violates the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. They said that this is a case where what happened was there was a scarcity of teachers in the parochial schools to teach secular subjects. So they said we will give a 15% pay supplement from the state budget for teachers teaching in the Roman Catholic schools, teaching secular subjects. The question was whether that violated the establishment law. The court said yes, it violated. And it evolved what is called the lemon test. The lemon test is simply the three-pronged test, which means that that law should have a clear secular purpose, purpose test. Second is the effect test. The primary effect of the law must be not to advance a religion, not to inhibit a religion. 
nothing to do with the religion. Stay neutral away. Stay away from the religion. The third was excessive entanglement with religion. Avoid excessive entanglement with religion. Now this te test is to the test for a for a, a, a scrutiny of the courts for almost 50 years. And I will refer to the last judgment, which is undone this judgment. It is thereafter that I refer to Marsh was Chambers, which was in 1983, where the Nebraska, the church, priest came and said the prayers. The court avoided applying the lemon test and instead said, this is a case where when the Constitution of the United States was drafted way back in 1789 and then the First Amendment in 1791, the, after the First Amendment was adopted, in the second or third session of the Congress, they actually called for priests and they got them to pray. Now, if this is contemporaneous exposito at its best, so you have evidence of the intention of the framers of the Constitution, that is, this would not fall foul of the Establishment Clause. So they said there is 200 year history going back to at the very start of the Republic. So they said, let's not apply the lemon test, this is a practice with historicity about it, and they allowed this prayer. Because this, I say this because in our parliament, questions have been uh, raised whether it was proper to have prayers before. Uh, but I do not know because I didn't have the time to go deep into it. Whether when the first parliament was convened, you had prayers of the kind we had when the parliament building was recently inaugurated, uh, when the Shengol was placed. I do not think I will be in a position to make a deeper comment on it unless I know what is the practice earlier applying the marsh test. This marsh test has been in fact followed even in a township which did not have this kind of a hoary tradition history and that is a town of Greece which is a local body in America not the Greece versus Galloway that is 572 US page 565 page 2 I mean the year 2000 they have accepted the next three judgments I am done with the US um, the next judgment is Lynch versus Donnelly uh, that is 465 United States page 668 at 1984 in this case what happened was a city in question during Christmas time they would have a display the display would consist of various things but it also included a crush the crush consisted of Christian characters like Jesus, Mary, and you know, all the characters. So they took objection to it, saying that you cannot be having this. You're actually promoting Christianity. You know, this is way back in 1984, when perhaps we had a greater um, number of Christians than perhaps they have now. Um, the majority view, the reasoning appears to be, total separation is not possible in absolute sense and some relationship between government and religion, religious organization is inevitable, it's not a vacuum. Justice Sandra O'Connor, who as you know was the first woman judge of the United States Supreme Court, she authored a concurring opinion and she actually proposed another test which is called the endorsement test. Now the second test is, and she says, quote, the second and more direct infringement is government endorsement or disapproval of religion. Endorsement sends a message to non-adherents that they are outsiders and not full members of the political community. It is going to be my submission before you, along with to state some statements which you will find in Bombay that if a political party, a representative, a minister even, if he takes sides and makes statements, it may amount to uh, uh, an endorsement of a religion, anathema to our secular framework. I'll be dealing with it in a little bit more detail. The last judgment, which is completely, you know, taken a different view, 
and perhaps represented a change in the perceptions, and you call them the conservative judges of the U.S. Supreme Court. Perhaps it's 6-3, that is there are nine judges, and six sided, uh, uh, took the majority view. Kennedy versus Bremerton, that is 597 U.S. page one. Um, this is a very interesting case, because what happened in this case was, perhaps you will laugh at it, that this can happen. There was this uh, Kennedy who was a football coach. He was an employee of a public school. After the games were over, he had this habit of going on his knees and simply praying. There were uh, three, two or three occasions earlier than when disciplinary action was taken against him where he was warned that you are doing it on a, in a public school while you're on duty. So even thereafter, when, when I'm so sorry. When, uh, after the games were over and the players were actually, you know, they, have, they run around the field and give thanks or whatever. He was alone and he went down on his knees, the silent prayer. So he was shown the door. So he went to court. Finally, it reached the Supreme Court. Supreme Court had to deal with the lemon test, which I have already explained. Secular purpose, primary effect being that you should not support religion, and thirdly, an excessive entanglement with religion. The Supreme Court said that the amendment to the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution contains three clauses I have said. It gives three separate rights. Freedom from establishment of a church, the free exercise of religion, free exercise clause, and third, the free speech clause. So 191A, Article 25, and secularism all rolled up in, you know, in a very condensed, very brief article. So they said that they need not be hostile players, they can be complementary. The method of interpretation adopted in Lemon is really very unsatisfactory because after um, going along, you know, the courts be began to estimate rather than actually assess what would be the result if you apply the Lemon test. And they said that it's a little bit chaotic. So finally, they in fact developed what is called the historic uh, uh, originalist theory, essentially the originalist theory. And they said that has America come to a stage where you can't even pray? The religious groups have in fact exulted because you have been, America is being returned back to what it was always. Always a right to pray was there, right to exercise free speech was always there. And this conflict on the base of lemon test was completely flawed and directed his reinstatement. So lemon test is out now. Now we have this historic test, but it is seesaw. Actually, you know, you you will feel that you know liberal judges were conservative judges. You may any time you know you can go back because lemon test held the field for about 50 years. If you apply the stare decisis, how would you uh, you know take it so lightly? You can overrule it, but then they have done that. And there was another judgment which I have not referred to in this. That is called the flagpole test. There was a city which had three flagpoles and. One flagpole, you would hoist the U.S. flag. The second, the city flag, um, Commonwealth flag. And the third was a flag which the participants in a meeting, so the city hall would be rented out. Once, for the first time, a religious group wanted to, a Christian flag had to be hoisted. They said, no, we will not give it to you because we will fall foul of the establishment clause. So they said, they will not do it. They went to court and the court said, nothing wrong if you allow the flag to be hoisted. This is another, uh, this is again in 2022, this judgment came. So what I am just bringing to your notice is how even in the United States, under the separation between church and state, the First Amendment is slowly working itself out. Now in United Kingdom, as you know, it's an established church. But you can't call it an unsecular country because you can't confuse the fact that there is an established church with free exercise. The Russian constitution gives freedom to practice religion. As to what is the actual freedom on the ground available, we can't be assessing it. If you go to France, now France is one country which following 
the French Revolution, and you know, the reason wa was that the royalty was always aided by the clergy. So the, when the workers, the poor suffered, who suffered, revolted, they revolted against the church. And they said this fusion between political authority and religious authority must be snapped. And that is why in 18 or 1905, they passed a law under which various reforms have been made and in, you know, they, they have stuck by it and they are known for their, uh, it's very difficult to match up to France, what they do. Turkey is one country which uh, after Kemal Atruk, when, uh, as you know, the Ottoman Empire fell after the First World War and uh, Kemal Atruk actually overthrew the caliph, I mean, the, the ruler there, he followed the French model. Very, very strict model, actually. Now, over the uh, past 10, 20 years, it is found the present political dispensation is more religious-minded. Now, they have a department in Turkey which over which about $2 billion is, is an annual budget, which actually, you know, prints the Friday prayer to be said in about one lakh mosques in Turkey and in countries all over the world where Turkey has, you know, uh, rights, I mean, sovereignty in terms of embassies and so on and so forth. They have a, a television channel and on request, they will issue a fatwa, which has led to many controversies. But so therefore, what I'm saying is that world over, we see uh, the destiny of uh, um, secularism waning and waxing of uh, the concept, depending on who is ruling, because there is no staticity about it. Now, coming to India, let us take uh, the, the provisions of the constitution as it stands. The preamble to the constitution, as, as you know, we the people solemnly reserved to constitute ourselves into a sovereign, secular, socialist, I mean, let us leave out uh, socialist and secular and f try to find out on its own, on a reading of the constitution, the same result would be achieved. And no particular result is going to be achieved by the insertion of the word constitution. Sovereign democratic republic. To secure unto ourselves justice, social, economic, political. The first aim is to get justice. Second is equality quality of uh, opportunity and uh, third is liberty, liberty of thought, belief, expression and worship. And last but not the least, fraternity. These are, as you know, the five golden um, themes that guide any citizen or a judge or a lawyer when we interpret the constitution. Uh, it is settled in, since Adad Narayan, that a preamble cannot found a right, doesn't provide a substantive basis for claiming a right or suffering a liability. Coming to the actual uh, provisions in the constitution, let us find out where it's actually India is a secular country because we have seen the constitution assembly debates. All the members proceed on the basis that India is a secular country. So they said it's not really necessary to include the word secular. Article 14 proclaims that the State shall not deny equality or the equal protection of the laws. Article, Article 14, you must understand, is available not only to citizens, but it is available to all persons residing in India. Like Article 21, no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except in accordance with the procedure established by law. Article 15, as you know, it speaks about the command against the state in denying equality to citizens. Now, what is a, this is a species, as you know, of the genus, Article 14. 15 is actually a species. It speaks about, you know, like access to hotels, bathing guards, public places, and so on and so forth. Article 16 again says, you should, state shall not deny equality, equality of treatment to citizens 
on the ground of religion here i may add at this juncture itself that apart from religion both in article 15 and 16 you will find the word race now why am i bringing it up in at the time when the constitution was framed and article 15 and 16 were drafted the founding fathers were fully aware that we are a multi racial community otherwise there is no need because the citizens must belong to more than one race they must belong to more than one religion so it is because more than one caste so they wanted to make clear that you will not deny equality on the basis of race or religion so every citizen is in other words ensured by virtue of this clutch of three articles 14 to 16 of equal treatment from the state kindly bear in mind if you take out the word secularism from the preamble is it going to affect these rights which are available otherwise to citizens and all persons under article 14 no that is not going to produce any result now let us come to article 19 19 gives you as you know freedoms a right to free speech expression right to move around all these are given to citizens as you know these rights are all cannot be denied on the basis of religion 21 again it's even more wide because it is uh, given to all persons and not merely citizens then you have articles 25 to 30 which is a lean spin of provisions actually which um, speak about the actual provisions dealing with secularism articles 25 and 26 actually are right to religious freedom they are actually the classification is right to religious freedom please notice that no article 25 it says subject to public order morality and health and to the other part other provisions of part 3 every person not citizen every person shall have the right to profess practice and propagate religion there are many things in this first of all if you see the us constitution gives the establishment clause and the free exercise clause you don't find any of these conditions like subject to public morality health so you may ask can cannot the government deal with issues arising from morality health public order doctrine of police power which is to be found in the us constitution takes care of that so you have the same power perhaps a wider power in the us to deal with you know problems like you know like if for example if there is a fire and the church is going to be burned down you can't say that you know please save the church because if you save the church i mean if you don't save the church the religion will be in trouble but they'll say no no because if you don't put out the fire there'll be other buildings which will be on fire so the overriding public interest will reign supreme and this giving you health take for example you know the case which uh, went to the supreme court which dealt with uh, uh, bursting crackers during diwali inoculation needed for you know preserving the health subject to all these um, elements every person has a right to do three things profess um, um, uh, practice and uh, propagate now each of these three things are actually source of substantive rights relating to freedom profess means the right to get up anywhere and say i am a hindu i am a christian i am a musliman or a parsi or whatever now the constitution does not impose upon you the need to actually profess any religion just as much as you have the right to practice profess you can very well say i don't believe in god i am an agnost i am a theist and i am or i am a deist i am a you know there are various versions of it if you look into the study of philosophy you, it's, it's amazing uh, um, we have varieties so at any rate for those who believe in a religion you the first right is to profess which you can declare anywhere the second is to practice you i refer to you in the preamble the freedom of belief and worship no you may have a belief in god and if you see the shirur math case which is perhaps the leading case 
and which I would humbly again request you to kindly go through it uh, because it gives you the picture which has been followed right up to the, uh, the judgment in uh, Shabrimala case. It says, uh, what is religion? You know, religion is understood generally in the Western world as a relationship between man and his creator. His idea of creation, how he is here in this world and what is relationship. Shirur Matke is, however, took a different, slightly different view about uh, religion in the context of Hinduism. Now, Hinduism actually is a very, very extraordinary, unique religion. Is it a religion itself? Uh, you know, they ask the question, then you get many, many answers. Now, why is that? If you see the Semitic religions, both Christianity and Muslim, you will see certain common features and there is a common founder. You have one holy book, one dogma, one set of beliefs, an authority which will enforce all this. Now, Hinduism, on the other hand, has this great blessing of Catholicity about it, that it is thrown open its shores to all kinds of beliefs. You will find atheists among the Hindus. You will see that Jainism, to begin with, the first revolt against um, uh, uh, the, the Hindu uh, concept was Jains. Then you have the Buddhist. Then you have um, so many varieties. You know, the latest uh, you can say Swami Dayanand in the Arya Samaj. And so many social reformers. But they have this, you know, one common belief, which is that the truth is many, but wise men... I'm my metamorphosis, the best. I focus like I'm threatening the leader with my rhymes. I'm keen with precise aim from the heights. You can't be... The airspace changes and you have a different God. No, there's only one God. And the concept of God... And if you read the Hindu view of life, which again I would humbly request you to buy, Sarvepalli Radha Krishna. It provides you with an excellent understanding, exposition of what Hinduism is and different ways of watching the water closer, you music, dance, whatever you, whichever way you go, you will go to the, the fight. So this difficulty in defining religion in the Shurur Mat case and uh, therefore, uh, you ultimately, glass, you think ultimately the, uh, the point is this. If you read article 25 along with 26, which you must indeed do. Because I said you have the right to uh, propagate also. 26 speaks about denominational rights. It says that every denomination of any religion will have uh, the following rights. You know, they will have the right to establish institutions which are religious and charitable. They can acquire immovable and immovable property. They can manage their affairs in the matters of religion with this Article 26B. Now, Article 26B, in conjunction with Article 25, has created a lot of litigation. In fact, uh, in Devaru, Devaru case, 19, AR 1958 Supreme Court, this very question arose. The Gauda Saraswat uh, Brahmin community, they were running a temple, group of temples. Now, they uh, allowed, I mean, people, Hindus were permitted to actually go and worship in the temples, but certain ceremonies, according to them, could be undertaken only by members of the Gauda Saraswat uh, the, the, uh, the community. So, the, the as you know, under Article 25.2, notwithstanding the right to practice religion, it is open to the state to make laws to throw open the Hindu temples of a public character to worship to Hindus and also to bring about reform and welfare measures. So the court took the view, while you have the right under Article 26B, to manage your affairs in matters of religion, Article 25.2 enables the state to make laws, throwing open the public temples of your uh, denomination to worship, public worship. So they reconciled, they were to rec reconcile both Article 25.2 and Article 26b 
by saying that since you are actually throwing open the temple for worship by all Hindus, but you are only saying that certain ceremonies because of the old tradition, it can be conducted by members of the particular community of a certain training. You can uh, uh, reconcile it that way. Otherwise, the law made under Article 25.2b will prevail over the fundamental right under Article 26.b to manage your affairs in religion. So this is another uh, aspect of uh, 25.2b because why I am saying all this is in the context of a secular state. What is the place of a regulation by the state as is contemplated in Article 25? You may ask. How can the state make its foray into matters which are essentially secular? That question has been made very clear in a judgment which is related to excommunication of a priests, I mean of, of a person, on religious grounds. And that judgment is AR 1963 Supreme Court. I'm so sorry, 63 Supreme Court. Page 653. 653. There what happened was a person was excommunicated on religious grounds. He, the Bombay excommunication uh, prevent, prevention law prevented excommunication on any ground. That was challenged. The Supreme Court took the view while Devaru is there but you cannot in the ground, on, in, the, uh, in, the, in the guise of actually bringing about reforms in the church within the meaning of Article 25.2b, you cannot change the basic identity or the rights of that religious denomination. Otherwise, you will be entering into the field of religion, which is actually prohibited under Article 25, read with Article 26b. You have reflections of this in um, the... Um, I'll just give you the citation, Yagna Puradas G, which is a must read for you. AR 1966 Supreme Court, triple one nine. And I will just refer to one case in this context, which is, I think you must be aware because it emanated from here, Adityan versus um, State of Kerala. As a 2008 SEC page um, 106. Now, Adityan uh, presented an interesting set of facts. The Malayala Brahmins from the state of Kerala objected to the appointment of a member of, a, um, I think, a Dalit community as a priest. This was not a case actually under Article 26b, not a denominational temple. You must realize that. It is made very clear. It was a case of a, a temple which is actually run by the Hindus uh, as they are generally they are the rights under Article 25. So the question was whether you can reconcile Devaru with uh, 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 this uh, kind of an approach where you take away the very right of the Malayala Brahmin who was accustomed to actually performing the rights. The Supreme Court said, kindly look at Article 17. Article 17 has abolished untouchability. The same principle has been used, as you know, in the Shabrimala case, where Article 17 has been used for the purpose of uh, establishing that you cannot have gender inequality and if you rob a woman of her right to enter the Shabrimala, you are treating her as an untouchable within the meaning of Article 17. So this is a dynamic use of Article 17. So here, in, in regard to Adityan, the court said that the members of the scheduled class, members of the backward class, depressed classes have historically gone through so much of suffering. And the Devasam board had actually started a school to train people from all tasks in the task of conducting priestly functions. So that once you have passed that, if you have had an old historical uh, kind of a practice where only members of a certain higher caste could do it, said, that has to go end. And Adityan makes a, uh, it's a high water, water, watershed in this field. The other judgment, I am sorry, it is Saifuddin Sahib, AR 62 Supreme Court 853. It's again a must read. I'm in connection with this uh, Saifuddin 62 Supreme Court 853, I may just add a, a, 
recent development which has taken place, this is called uh, in a bench of tree, has um, referred this um, decision actually for uh, being posted along with the nine judges bench. Because the question was, Article 25 begins with the word subject to morality, public mora uh, morality, public order and health and other parts of the constitution. 26 begins only with the word subject to public morality, health and uh, um, morality. Public, uh, sorry, public order, health and morality doesn't say subject to the other part. So they say that you cannot therefore import it. But then in, uh, in the Shabrimala case, they have said that this view may not be correct and this is going, perhaps going to be reconsidered, uh, this question. Now, having uh, briefly touched about Article 25 and 26, you come to 27. It is one of the important features of secularism which has been uh, engrafted in the constitution. What does it say? No tax shall be levied and appropriated for maintaining of any religion. No person shall be compelled. So it's a freedom from taxation and a limitation on the ta power of taxation as far as the state is concerned. You may only notice one judgment, 2011, 2 SCC, page 568, wherein the Supreme Court clarified that unless it, the taxation is excessive, or rather if the taxation is a small amount only, even if it goes into the coffers of the state for the purpose of actually maintaining or sets it, it may not fall foul of uh, Article 27. Now, Article 28 is a, a, a provision which I would like to draw your kind attention to in some detail. I am aware of the fact that, uh, you know, it may have current relevance actually also. You know, Article 28, it says that no uh, state-run institution shall impart religious instruction. Exact words are that if a state is maintaining, maintaining out of its own funds, then you cannot impart a religious instruction. 28.2 on the other hand says, nothing in Article 28.1 will apply in respect of a religious, uh, an institution which is so administered by the state, if it is bound to do so under the terms of a trust, which exhorts you to provide religious instruction. So the ban in Article 28.1 is lifted in that case. Now 28.3, it speaks about uh, freedom from compulsion to learn religious instruction in a school which is either receiving aid from the state or which is recognized by the state unless the parent in the case of a minor or if the student if he's capable of giving his consent he gives his consent now therefore it, it falls into three parts religious instruction is concerned if the state is wholly maintaining a religious inst of a, an educational institution there is no question of religious instruction being provided therein. If only aid or it is recognized, then the community which is actually administering the institution, which will be in the private sector, it is free, in fact, to provide religious instruction. It is even free to have public worship in the, uh, in, in the institution. The only restriction is that in such an event, you cannot compel anyone who does not want either to receive the religious instruction or to participate in the worship, to participate in it unless and until he agrees to it. This is the sum and substance of it. Now, the question as to what is religious instruction is also engaged the Supreme Court. You'll see that uh, uh, the famous case of Aruna Roy, uh, I'm sure it rings a bell. It, it, it uh, related to the national uh, curriculum, which was 
brought into place following the Chavan Committee report. The Chavan Committee report said that having regard to the degradation of moral values which was found, it is necessary to inculcate a value-based education and there would be nothing wrong. On the other hand, it will be highly useful if you teach children about it, religion. Telling children about religion is different from religious instruction being provided, in other words. The Supreme Court has accepted that principle and said, yes, you can provide it in the, uh, it, has been, uh, it has been green signaled in, in that case. It has also received the approval of the Supreme Court in an earlier case, also that is in 1973, 71-2 SEC page 269. That is called the DAV case. Now this DAV case is a case, very interesting case where the state of Punjab, as you know, was constituted as other states were on linguistic basis. The predominant, uh, the, the members of the population was of uh, six, Punjabi six. Now they spoke Punjabi. The Hindus were actually the minority. So DAV is actually the Arya Samaj representing the interests of Hindus. Now the Guru Nanak University was uh, enacted, act was enacted. And some of the Hindu colleges which were formerly affiliated to the Punjab University were directed to be affiliated in terms of the geographical division to the newly, con uh, newly uh, promulgated uh, Guru Nanak University Act. So they took two objections. They said that uh, the, the Arya Samaj is a religious minority. That the court settled the position in that case which has been followed in the TMI piece, namely that you decide whether a, a population is a minority or not with reference to a state law which is challenged with reference to the population of that minority in that state. Whereas if you are challenging a provision which is in a, a brought about by the central legislature, you'll have to see the population in the whole country. So here in Punjab, the Hindus were in a minority. So they became a religious minority. So they were permitted, they also set up a claim that a linguistic minority. So in that context, I would like to draw your attention kindly to Article 29.1 of the Constitution. Now 29.1 says, you will bear this in mind when I will take you to some of the other cases. 29.1 says that all sections of, sections of uh, persons having a distinct uh, language, script and culture shall have the right to conserve it. Please remember this. A very important right. So they said that you, there is nothing wrong in going for an agitation even to conserve your language. Look what the Supreme Court says. And in the context of what was uh, sort of be forced upon them because they were asked to learn about Guru Nanak. The court said there's nothing wrong. You, it's actually, it's only a provision which enables the university to prescribe a course teaching about Guru Nanak. You are free to take the course. You are not, you, you can say you're opting out. You're not going to be compelled. So both ways they said, and there's nothing wrong about also learning about a saint. So this DAV case was later followed in the Aruna Roy case, which is now established that teaching about education is not the same thing as religious instruction. And just as I mentioned about the American decision in Abington, that is in 1963 Supreme Court, US, where also they said that you can have a study of comparative religion. Let us not run away from the reality that truth is found and expressed in diverse forms. And to say that no, not have a tunnel vision that truth is the only way that I proclaim it, my way or highway. So that, 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 that is the other side. Then Article 30, as you know, speaks about the rights of the minorities to establish and um, uh, run uh, educational institutions. Now from, uh, you know, when you, when you go through these provisions, you will come to know that this bunch of rights are available irrespective of whether you have the word secular in the preamble or not. Kindly think for yourselves, even if you take, took away the word preamble from the constitution by an amendment, which I will point out, the Supreme Court has said it cannot be done. 
none of none of the features of secularism which have been accepted as in fact very much part of the basic structure otherwise is going to go away so there is no way you can take out kick out secularism by a side wind as it were by uh, dipping your hands into the preamble and taking it out in 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 in, in short now apart from uh, these features which according to me spell out the features of secularism as we find in india you have uh, a section 123 of the representation of peoples act because why i say this is apart from you know forays into the educational era field where they are trying to compel somebody to do learn something against a choice um the most important aspect about secularism in india is the political one you know the when you talk about secularism versus politics and secularism and politics you will have to consider a few judgments which are absolutely uh, seminal the first judgment is the judgment celebrated judgment of the uh, supreme court in sr bombay versus uh, um my uh, state the citation is 1994 3 scc page 1 i would request you to read paragraphs uh, because uh, many of the judges have written judgments all of them have agreed that uh, secularism is a basic feature of the constitution the uh, chief justice uh, ahmadi agreed with whatever has been written about secularism by justice uh, um jeevan reddy and justice savant i would request you to read the judgment of justice jeevan reddy for many reasons if you read paragraph 300 and i think I, that, that has been supplied to you it is uh, paragraph number 309 and 310 i hope you have uh, got that uh, with you i would like to read certain portions of paragraph 109 and uh, sorry 309 and 10 yes with your leave i read what given the uh, okay before that a 309 inspired by the indian tradition of tolerance and fraternity for whose sake the greatest son of modern india mahatma gandhi laid down his life and seeking to redeem the promise of religious neutrality held forth by the congress party the founding fathers proceeded to create a state secular in its outlook and egalitarian in its actions they could not have countenance the idea of treating the minorities as second class citizens just bear this in your mind on the contrary the dominant thing appears to be that the majority community hindus must be secular and therefore help the minorities to become secular for it is the majority community alone that can provide the sense of security to others then paragraph 310 is of the most utmost importance given the above position it is clear that any party or organization seeks to fight the elections on the base of a plank which has the proximate effect of eroding the secular philosophy of the constitution it would be, certainly be guilty of following an unconstitutional course of action political parties are formed and exist to capture or share state power that is their aim they may be association of individuals but one cannot ignorance ignore the functional relevance an association of individuals may be devoted to the propagation of religion it would be a religious body another may be devoted to promotion of culture it would be a cultural organization they are not aimed at acquiring state power whereas a political power party does and thereafter it, it is stated if a political party exposing a particular religion comes to power that religion tends to become in practice the official religion 
all other religions come to acquire a secondary status please remember the words of just sandra o'connor employing the endorsement test all other religions come to acquire a secondary status a at any rate a less favorable position this would be plainly antithetical to articles 14 to 16 and 25 which you have read and the entire constitutional scheme adumbrated above under our constitution no party or organization can simultaneously be a political and a religious party it has to be either should same same the same would be the position if a party or organization acts and or behaves by word of mouth print or in any other manner to bring about the said effect it would be equally guilty of an act of unconstitutionality you must realize that this judgment dealt with the power of uh, the central government in article 356 to dismiss governments and to impose president's rule there were a number of cases now three cases they from uh, madhya pradesh rajasthan and uh, himachal pradesh they were in the aftermath of uh, the destruction of the babri masjid on 6th of december 1992 the, 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 the rss came to be banned immediately after the ban the governments which were actually voted on the bjp political power, uh, manifesto they actually refused to implement the ban imposed on the rss which was actually the i think the third or fourth ban the reason was they were themselves actually active members of the rss they they were ones at least so the governor sent reports saying that there is no way the ban and uh, is going to be effectuated and what is more an atmosphere is being created that they wanted to rebuild the the the, the temple there which had where the mosque had stood that which had been demolished on the 6th of december and things like that and some reports were sent so this judgment is uh, important for the uh, principle that it has been in fact questioned in uh, in justice patnaik's uh, um, edited um, uh, constitution law uh, that on the ground of uh, uh, failure to adhere to secularism you can dismiss a government under article 356 he posed the question whether it can be and uh, things like that whatever that be the, the the substance of the matter is secularism has been declared and to be a part of the basic feature and what i have read out from para 310 with what i have said about what justice sandra o'connor in o'connor's case has declared that the state shall not endorse the state shall be neutral the state shall treat each, each religion equally there is no favored religion the state does not have a religion of its own the state is not theocratic now this is where i wanted to say that if a minister or however high ranking he may be whoever he may be if he by word of mouth or actions gives a impression that he is siding with a particular religion then he the flag of secularism is is down is buried at least temporarily you have to disinter and bring it out so the 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 whole idea is you must realize that also it has been held that secularism actually is a facet of equality if you treat all religions equally that is secularism because you don't have any favorites you take, apply the same law whatever is it you apply it equally subject to constitutional limitation like article 30 or whatever you you produce equality and and you're fair to equal you you don't patronize you don't have a bias towards or against any religion so this is the uh, substance of uh, secularism as uh, held in bombay now just two years almost two years after 94 on 11 12 1995 a batch of 12 cases came to be decided they are referred to as the hindutva cases they are all reported in 1996 volume 1 scc which were we have decided by the same bench headed by justice uh, js verma in 1996 1 scc page 130 prabhu was a shiv sena candidate he was elected 
in the course of his campaign he made various statements which were alleged to fall foul of section 123 3 of the representation of people's act 1951 if you have the act with you i would request you to read it otherwise i can tell you the substance of it it is a corrupt practice for a candidate or his agent or anyone with the consent of the candidate or his agent to indulge in various acts section 1233 is directed against the making of an appeal based on religion inter, inter alia apart from caste and thing language for example it has had a pretty torturous route to you know get where it has gotten now in the year uh, 1961 section 123 went underwent its final amendment to bring it into the current shape ak sen the law minister who actually piloted the bill said that he was dropping the words repetitive appeals which was the original requirement unless you made a, there was a pattern of appeals to religion it would not constitute a corrupt practice he said that mind you this is happening in the very first decade after independence you are talking about the 50s 60s even at that time though the constitution had been adopted there were elements in our republic who were not very happy and they kept making appeals and the uh, just to prove repeat repeated repeated attempts was a very very herculean task so ak sen said the voice has become so pronounced that that we have to just even a singular appeal even one appeal during an election campaign based on religion is sufficient to constitute the supreme court accepted it now in prabhu's case the supreme court justice verma it's perhaps a much misunderstood judgment because it is coming for huge criticism um, in respect of the hindutva Uh, aspect i'll explain in the course of the arguments the case that was sort of a build up was hinduism is a unique religion not like the other religions no organized structure no one common author of the religion one person in whom all authority is vested no one dogma there are so many possibilities in hinduism actually it's a way of life attributed to sarve pulli radha krishnan the philosopher president of india so they said that it will not be a correct practice when you simply refer to hinduism hindutva this is js verma actually accepts this principle he said merely if you use hindu hindutva or hinduism that is not an appeal based on religion i would request you to read 1996 i don't know whether you have it with you i had asked him to uh, because in that judgment the court actually went on to say refer to the earlier judgments which i have referred to some of them shirur math uh the yagna yagna paradas ji's case about the nature of religion see because what has happened is there is this theory that hindus the word hindu comes from the sindhu river the word hindu was coined by the iranians persians who said those who lived on the indian side of the sindhu river then actually northwest it will be in pakistan now so they were referred to the persians as hindus so therefore it is actually a, a geographical religion all persons who were living on the side of the sindhu they were known as hindu so th- that is what hinduism is and it is not really a religion so jainism buddhism sikhism all of it actually birthplace is india sindhu as we know it today they are all religions of india so that is perhaps the cultural nationalism of a particular party we have today whatever that be the 
court said that there is nothing wrong in uh, using the word Hinduism and, uh, and it. the court actually went on to wade through the facts of each case thereafter and looked at the speeches per se. For example, in the case of Bal Thakre, who was also whose election was also set aside, and Prabhu's case, both of them actually finally lost before Justice Verma because he said that actually you are abusing this Hinduism because he said that you may nothing nothing wrong per se in using Hinduism or Hindutva, but you if you actually abuse it within the meaning of Section 123.3 as a vote catching device. You abuse it, then you are within the net of section 123.3. Many cases were decided on that basis. Now, I have actually a couple of criticisms to offer against this judgment. In fact, what happened was this judgment was sought to be reopened before the Supreme Court in 2016. And that is the case of Abiram Singh versus C.D. Ummachan. Ummachan, Ummachan, not uh, Ummachan. Uh, that is reported in uh, 2017, 1 SCC page 639, 639, by a majority of uh, fours to three, uh, they have um, uh, brought about certain changes in the, in the Hindutva judgments. But while on Hindutva judgments, the criticism which I have to offer is this. You see, the version of uh, Hinduism which this court relied upon is all based on judgments of the Supreme Court and other material. Perhaps, I am not too sure about it. The political party in question and the other political parties which perhaps uh, tout Hindutva rely upon the works of a person called Savarkar. Savarkar has a different, as a version of Hindutva. Savarkar was uh, the elected the president of the Hindu Mahasabha in the year 1937. He was a barrister, a brilliant mind, a poet. He was imprisoned for life for fighting against the British and the allegation against him by some of the political parties is that he petitioned for mercy and then he was moved out from the Andaman prison to a prison in India. But there, there may be no two ways of uh, looking at the fact that he was a barrister and possessed indeed of a brilliant mind. In fact, if you read about him, you'll find his take on casteism. He said, Casteism has no place in Hinduism. Now, he has written a book, a short book. I, I was not able to lay my hands on it. But I would have loved to read it. Because, uh, but the, the, the substance of it is, it's, it's about nationalism, basically. It may perhaps have the effect of placing certain minorities on a uh, on a certain kind of a pedestal. I would hazard, you know, making a fur further statements without having read it. But what I am actually up against is the fact that the version of Hindutva according to Sarvarkar perhaps may not have been gone into by the Supreme Court in the Hindutva cases. Supreme Court has proceeded on the basis of the earlier judgments which have said that it is difficult to define, uh, define Hinduism. But Hinduism is very much the religion. I'll tell you why. If Hinduism is not a religion, how will the members of that religion exercise the rights under Article 25.1 and 26.3? So the Hinduism has to be a religion. In Hindutva also, if it is equated and if it is treated as a religion, it's a way of life. A question may arise, whose way of life? Now, one of the other criticism, which perhaps with great respect, I am now a student of law, I would raise is, in the 1996 1 SEC page 130, 
the Supreme Court goes on to say in one paragraph that what was contemplated perhaps is a uniform religion, a uniform culture, obliterating all cultures. Here I have an objection based on it being perincurium. Kindly look at Article 29, one of the Constitution, if you have part of the Constitution. 29.1 actually makes it a fundamental right. Any section of people having a distinct language, script or culture shall have the right to preserve it, conserve it. Now, how can you have a uniform culture if sections of people in India, living in any part of India, and the Supreme Court has also made it clear in the DAV case, that the right under Article 39, 29.1 is not confined to the religious, um, the, the right of the religions, the, the, the religion, the religious denominations, the people, sections of the people of belonging to a particular religion may also have the right under Article 29.1. They can claim that right. But the horse religion, any section of people, can, on the basis of their distinct language, distinct script, distinct culture, have the right to conserve it. Now, if a section of the people have the right to conserve a culture, can you have an a, overarching culture where there is a uniform culture all over the country, where you override all the other, overwhelm all cultures which are to be found in India? Now, the dynamic idea of Jawaharlal Nehru in the discovery of India where he says unity in diversity cannot be stretched to actually wipe out diversity. It cannot mean that you will achieve unity by completely obliterating, wiping out culture, I mean diversity. So this is the second, uh, you know, the criticism which I would like to point out. I mean the third also I have said that because it is article uh, 25 and 22 requires a religion and Hinduism is a religion. The attempt to actually confine, you know, what has happened is the, in, in, in these cases, the Supreme Court actually also laid down that what section 123.3 actually prohibits is an appeal made by a candidate to vote for him on the basis of his religion or to refrain from voting for the other candidate on the basis of his religion. The question arose before the seven judges bench in uh, Abhiram Singh versus C.D. Komachan. The question was, is this a proper interpretation of a salutary provision like section 123.3, which has got both secularism and democracy at its heart? The seven judges by a majority of four to three with Justice Chandrachur dissenting and um, this is Lokur, this is um, Thakur and um, this is Bob Day being part of the majority. They said that a purposeful interpretation, if it is placed on section 123.3, it would mean that even if it is a vote, if an appeal made on the basis of the religion of the voter, it will fall foul of section 123.3. So religion has no place in an election place. You cannot disenchant, enchant the electorate with an appeal based on religion. It is a secular practice which is central to our democratic process. The whole idea of secularism is religion is your private affair. Keep it private. It may have relevance in a public sphere to the extent that it has. Make use of it. Outside of the st that, the state must maintain complete complete neutrality and keep it, take its hands off. This is the um, substance of uh, what was um, laid down and I would request you to read this judgment also. Now, Section 29A of the Representation of Peoples Act deals with registration of political parties. Section 29 says, subsection 3 says, that you have to make a declaration that you will uphold secularism. 
every political party is obliged when it seeks registration to give a declaration that it will uphold the uh, secular, uh, secular, I mean, uh, uphold secular, uh, secularism, secularism. A question arose in, a, in fact, a case from Kerala as to whether the election commission has the power to deregister a political party because it was calling for bunts. In that case, it was bunts. And the Supreme Court took the view that as it stood, because it is a quasi-judicial power to uh, uh, register a political party, you ca cannot invoke Section 21 of the General Clauses Act, which is applicable only to an executive or a legislative act. And they therefore said that uh, you cannot uh, deregister, election commission cannot uh, uh, deregister a, a, a political party for violation of the declaration which is given. Now, Section 29A with Section 123 provides for a very strong bulwark against the abuse of religion in the electoral field, in the democratic field. Now, I would like to point out what really happens on the ground, perhaps. Appeals to religion, which are made by a person who is not a candidate within the meaning of Section 79B of the Representation of People's Act, it has been held are to be excluded. This means, if you read Section 79B of the uh, Representation of People's Act, when does a person become a candidate? So it speaks about a particular time when he holds himself out to be a candidate. It's only a candidate who can commit an electoral offense, a corrupt practice. The, there are judgments right from 1975 supplementary SCC page one, the Indira Nehru Gandhi case, and judgments which have been followed right up to the one of the Hindutva cases where 96-1 at CC, page 392. There also the, the, it has been held. Whatever a candidate does prior to it becoming a candidate with the meaning of section 79 will have to be taken out of consideration. This is a huge problem according to me. Why I say this is, if, you know, at a particular point of time when the elections are a far off thing, if the mind of the electorate is either made the subject matter of influence on the base of religion, if it becomes a vote bank, see, it's in my view, secularism does not mean that you know you can make minorities a vote bank. It's as much against secularism to create a vote bank among minorities or among members of the majority community as well. Making anybody, you know, then you become, see, what is the whole idea behind all these laws ultimately, and as far as the electoral law is concerned? The right to vote, which we have, um, I'm a party to that, we have said that it is part of the constitutional right. But at, at any rate, it is a statutory right which has got certain attributes of uh, the fundamental right under Article 19 one day. The right to seek information about the assets. You know about it under Right to Information Act. And Supreme Court is in a slew of decisions that uh, enlarge that right. The substance of it is the importance of the little man with a little piece of paper going into the ballot box, whether the EVM or the ballot box, and then putting in his vote, exercising his franchise. You can change the fortunes of the political party in power. You can bring down the most powerful power. This is the whole idea of a democracy. Now, what does it really require of the electorate, that is us, the citizenry, who go and cast the votes? When you go and cast your vote, you should be dispassionate. You should not be biased. You should have the faculty to analyze Take, strike the balance, find out the pluses and minuses of a political party, the candidates who come. In fact, the election commission judgment show the number of criminal cases you have. They are supposed to disclose all that. So when you make a dispassionate and rational choice in the election about who should rule you, this is the matter which goes to the root of a democratic process. 
See, without this, election is a farce. It is in this context that all the vitiating factors in Section 123, be it appeals to religion, caste, language, which will actually hold, become, make you prisoners of your own ideas. If you create an identity based on any of these vitiating factors, be it religion, be it race, be it language, then what happens is it robs you of your faculties to analyze the credit and the debit side of a candidate or a political party and cast your vote. Take your country forward. Take your own life forward. So if this is the whole idea and if the ground is prepared ahead of the nomination date, if you have a system where everything is actually peppered up and the voter has almost made up his mind to cast his vote, being influenced by one of those vitiating factors, unfortunately the law says all of this happened before you became a candidate. So my suggestion which I have, the period of 14 days is a little thing that I could do was, I was just thinking about it. So perhaps you can amend section 79B and add a provision that for the purpose of section 123.3, you'll be deemed to a candidate from a, a period, say one year or two years, because the whole idea is the proximity of time when the candidate is able to exhort the electorate to vote in favor of the candidate on any of these vitiating factors. It's the time when the election heat is on, when you actually communicate. Now, another thing is, supposing uh, the leader of a party comes and makes a speech and goes. The courts have held, unless you prove that the candidate had consented to the, of the leader of the party making that uh, speech, it's not a corrupt practice. So what would happen? Perhaps the leader will come, the candidate will not be there. The court has also said that if he is there, if the candidate is there at that meeting, his consent can be inferred. So if the, if the leader, a charismatic leader comes and delivers a speech and the whole sis, the system is actually, in a manner of speaking, spoiled, the, 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 the slate, clean slate of the mind of the voter is already interfered with, then nothing remains. So perhaps if you amend it section, under section 76B and make it, uh, uh, you know, uh, very clear that um, you cannot um, tinker with the electoral process by referring to any of the vitiating factors, I think perhaps this might be one of the solutions uh, which uh, might come in uh, useful. Now, I'll just, uh, I'll just conclude by referring to a few aspects more. Just would like to see what are the threats to secularism. See, the right to live is the most important life. If you do not have a secular country, it is the most paramount right of all, namely the right to exist, which is under threat. You, for example, take the case of Manipur. How many lives have been lost? How many places of religious worship, more than 200, have been destroyed? Is it based on persons warring, being belonging to, to, to different religions or are they different tribes? Be it either, it does not bring secularism a good name in India. The word goes around that we do not have a country which is really dedicated to secularism, that we are not strong enough. Does the media stand up in one voice, do they raise at one time? The role of the media is very, very important. It is not to sing our hosannas to the established powers that be. The fourth estate 
is a very, very powerful, potent instrument, particularly the visual media. If they stand as one against the government, forget, it, forget about you know, the, you know, the, the, the philosophy they may have, but on matters of this nature, you may take it that no government will be able to withstand a unified press or media, provided they have in them the fire of the constitution, the, the, the fire that will be burned on the fire of the rights of citizens who have died, places of worship which have been destroyed, be it in any part of India. I'm not, I, Manipur comes to my mind because it is one which is of recent relevance. This, I, I would say, therefore, riots. Next is riots. Now, you know, we should talk about riots. You know, you may think that riots happened after 2014. It, it, for the f perhaps the first riot took place in 1827. It was about dogs. The Parsis were very fond of their dogs and the British wanted to cull the dogs because they found that they were a threat some disease being spread. So the Parsis protested. So there was a riot. From then onwards, you will see any number of riots over a period of time and much before the partition, riots have happened. But post-independent, I mean, uh, after we've become a, I mean, solemn republic and we've adopted a constitution, it is my humble submission that under secularism, it becomes a bounden duty of the state, be it in the center, be it in the states, to protect the lives of all its citizens, regardless of religion, regardless of race, caste. Now, processions, apart from riots, religious processions are said to generate, excite, incite people into violence. It does not bring secularism again a good name. Attacks on place of worship, which I've already mentioned, and polarization is, is another factor which you know, we have to uh, certainly deal with. The, what is the way forward, actually? Now, Article 51A of the Constitution says every citizen is bound to abide by the Constitution. So the citizenry must rise an informed citizenry. There's no point in lying, you know, in bed and saying that, you know, I will not protest, I will not do anything, that the state do whatever it wants. You mount all kinds of criticism and display complete importance when it comes to your own actions. What, to, what is it that you're contributing? So fraternity is another thing. We have to forge together unions based on fraternity and fraternity irrespective of the religion or the caste that you may belong to. Both are considerations which in this century have outlived their use and the purpose is essentially, if at all, to bring you closer to whatever supreme being that you may believe in, but not to get at each other's throats. I would argue that secularism is absolutely indispensable for a democratic republic. If secularism is going to be removed by any government under the impression that by merely removing the word secularism, you are removing the features of secularism, which I have already pointed out, cannot be done. But even if it is removed, the fact is that it will sound the death knell of democracy. Without secularism, in a country with so many religions, so many languages, dialects, cultures, which is what Article 29.1 importantly speaks about, all of that we are at uh, uh, the danger of losing the very ethos of our country. I was watching a video about what happened in Pakistan. See, when the elections uh, came somewhere in uh, the 1968, 69, um, approximately that, that time, 
the Awami League in Bangladesh, which is basically a Bangla language speaking, there, there was a threat that they might come to power. It was set apart by India because of the geography it's divided. So the Urdu speaking majority in uh, West Pakistan, they would have none of it. So uh, 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 a huge uh, uh, revolt of place in what is today Bangladesh. So we have to I am not for a moment saying that you know that disappearance tendencies or that we are not a strong union or that unlike the civil war in the United States, uh, you know, seeing the fate of the union, nothing of that is going to happen. But we should be careful that you know we do not rock the boat too much. The fundamental duties actually of the constitution in, uh, imposes upon all citizens the, the duty to develop a scientific temper. In the context of secularism, because it's all about religion, the, you know, if you have a, a, a scientific temper in each one of us, and you do not allow the spark of scientific temper to die, when you approach such topics, you will certainly bring to bear a certain amount of objectivity, rationalism, to the study and understanding of religion. So now that also is uh, one of the things which uh, I would uh, 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 think that uh, should happen. Um, So I think I've come to a sudden end, but uh, tomorrow is Friday, and, um, uh, and I, I do not think there's anything more that uh, I can say, except that I'm still, you know, optimistic that uh, the optimistic that secularism will uh, survive. And my optimism comes uh, largely from the Catholicity of the Hindu religion itself. The vast majority of the Hindus are completely broad-minded, tolerant, and they do not treat religion in the manner in which religion is treated in other religions. The shores of this country was thrown open to other faiths, including Christianity and Islam. When there was no war, when Islam came in the 8th century, 9th century, they came as traders. Christianity came in, there was no army marching by their side. The shores of this country was thrown open by the people there, the king, the priest, they all accepted because Hinduism is essentially based on the quest for universal truth. The truth, seek the truth and truth will set you free. The highest level, according to me, of metaphysical inquiry, metaphysical inquiry in the views of Radha Krishnan, is search for truth for its sake. The concept of Aham Brahmasmi or Tattva Masi. See, in Hinduism, you will find this uh, a faith which uh, harbors dualism of uh, Madhava Acharya. You have the non dualism of Shankaracharya. The atheism which has been preached as part of, uh, the, of religion. So, the, the very innate faith which Hinduism is such that it is broad-minded enough to absorb. It's in fact it has done. The problem arises when it is misused, abused for the sake of politics, for the sake of gaining power. And that is where I think the, the, the greatest dangers lie. Otherwise, the Constitution in Articles 14 to 16, 19, 21, and 25 to 30 have clearly laid down 
what kind of secularism we have in India. If these provisions are actually adhered to, conform to, and we practice it on the ground, we do not have to have any fear of secularism. Equally, we should have less of cases under Section 123 which means that we don't have the election commission should of course be a completely neutral arbiter make it strong enough to deal with you know people who try to create public capital out of loopholes in the law like which i have pointed out about what happens when uh, you know appeals are made on the basis of religion and i would also say again that no functionary no representative no minister whoever he is, can endorse any religion, can take sides in a fight between religions. If, in particular, if you know the matter is in court, because that leads to the creation of an impression that the other religions are secondary, which they are not, because all religions, under the principle of Secularism must be treated equally. Thank you so much, Jehan. Thank you so much, sir, for this very informative session on the concept of secularism. As a token of gratitude, I request convener CLE Series 2024 and the Vice President KHCAA, Advocate Jissa Susan Thomas, Advocate Jay Krishnan Yu, CLE member and committee member of KHCAA, and Treasurer of KHCA, Advocate Varun C. Vijay, and other committee members to present a memento to Honorable Mr. Justice K.M. Joseph, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. As we have come to the end of the session, I request Advocate Varun C. Vijay, Treasurer, Kerala High Court Advocates Association, to propose the vote of thanks. I know it's a very late session, uh, but thank you, sir. A very good evening to all of you present here. What I am uh, assigned is to deliver the vote of thanks. I am grateful and thankful for giving me such an opportunity. And, uh, First of all, I would thank our chief guest, Honorable Mr. Justice K.M. Joseph, sir, for having agreed to participate in this function and for having honored this function by his inspirational and very informative speech, despite the busy schedule he has. And uh, I would also rather thank our Vice President, Jisa Susan Thomas for having given the introductory speech and the master of ceremony, as we all know, advocate Uttara Ashokan also. And uh, last not the least, the audience, the beloved audience, uh, we have our judges, Justice Jay Shankar sir, uh, Kausa sir, Raja sir, Kujikishan sir and uh, Ajit Kumar sir. Sophie Madam also was there, she had just left now. And a function cannot be a grand success without an audience, like a full packed audience like you. And all the senior members, senior lawyers, junior lawyers, everybody might have. I am sure that uh, the program, because of the constraints of the time, we would have loved more to hear from you, sir, and we hope to see you in more functions under the CLE banner, addressing many more topics. And uh, once again, I thank all of you in my personal capacity and in the name of the association. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I request everyone to rise for the national anthem.
ಉಚ್ಚಲ ಜಲಧಿತರಂಗ ತವ ಶುಭ ನಾಮೆ ಜಾಗೆ ತವ ಶುಭ ಆಶಿಷ ಮಾಮೆ ಗಾಹೆ ತವ ಜಯ ಗಾಧ ಜನಗಣ ಮಂಗಳ ಪಿಡಿಸ್ಕೊಳ್ಳೋ ಇಲ್ಲ ಬಿಲ್ಲ